Hello everyone, my name is Dmitry Vinnik and I'm a developer advocate on the Facebook open source team. Today I'll talk about modern web testing and how to go beyond uh, using Selenium when it comes to web. So let's take a look. Again, thank you everybody for joining. And as I said, today we'll talk about modern web testing. And what do I do? So I give you some of my credentials. Uh, my name is Dmitry, as I said, I'm an open source developer advocate. What it means is that we are working on this a Facebook open source program where we are trying to empower diverse communities through open source. Uh, since you know this screenshot has been taken, we actually updated our website. So I invite you to go check it out at opensource.facebook.com and you'll find our videos, blogs, and the projects that we are advocating for. I'm also focusing on mobile in particular, uh, Android, iOS, and hybrid development like React Native. And uh, as I mentioned, some of the projects like Litho, that helps you to build declarative UI frameworks, uh, Fresco, and Flipper for debugging on mobile applications. But less about that and more about open source. And uh, again, I'm very much passionate about open source, hence I'm talking about testing today, testing using open source technologies. Uh, what are our goals for today's presentation? I always like to establish goals because they will help us to establish our agenda. And first and foremost, I'd like to, uh, for us to choose the right test context and know where we're working with. Um, then we need to choose right level of testing. As I'll introduce you, hopefully you already know of, test pyramid and how to actually apply it to web context. And last but not least is choosing the right end-to-end -end test approach because that will be the most valuable, uh, I hope, takeaway from this presentation is how to do end-to-end -end testi testing that satisfies your developer's needs, whether you're using Django for development or anything else. Uh, we will try to take an approach of an end user, regardless of what you are using in the back end or even front end. All righty, so let's get to bit more details for this presentation and how do we usually test? That's an important question to ask. So we're all on the same page here. As I mentioned before, the test pyramid is usually the very good guidance and what people are introduced to when we are talking about testing. First level, the lowest level and the widest of them all, meaning it's supposed to have the most number of tests, uh, unit tests. They are just testing a single function, a single unit of work. They are the cheapest to write and maintain, the fastest, but they give you the lowest level of confidence in your overall application the system level. Then the integration test take place. This is where you're testing multiple functions in play, multiple components, how they interact with one another. And last but not least is end-to-end -end test. Going through the user scenario, your end user scenario that they will go through while using your application. And they are usually the most expensive ones, the slowest, but they give you the highest level of confidence. Hence, you're supposed to use very few of them compared to other levels. But how do we usually test web? Real test pyramids, you know, I like the test pyramid as I just showed you, in ideal scenario. Reality is very much different. Uh, what people usually end up using is ice cream cone pattern, hourglass, or cupcake. So, ice cream cone. Uh, the ice cream cone, it's basically inverted pyramid where you actually have the fewest number of unit tests, then you have service or integration tests, more of those, and a large suite of end-to-end -end tests. I actually worked with the companies before where this would be the reality, and that's usually the reality for many. And on top of this cone, you would have manual testing, which again, is not very much scalable for large teams and large applications. Our class is similar, again, you have uh, actually, lots of unit tests, lots of UI tests, but very few service tests. You, we can argue whether it's good or bad, but that's reality for many. And the cupcake. Cupcake is very much like the ice cone. Again, it's very much like an inverted pyramid. You have fewer unit tests, more integration tests, lots of automation UI tests, and a massive number of manual testing. Again, it's very much like the, um, the ice cream cone. But the idea is it's an inverted pyramid, meaning that the pyramid that we all like to talk about is not the reality for most. Uh, so we need to change that. You know, we need to change these uh, anti-patterns that some people would call it. I call it a reality, but I always like to hope for the best and, you know, um, advise us to change that. And the way to change it is uh, first to actually test something. And what is that something? Throughout today's presentation, we'll have this simple app to-do app that usually people use for 
lots of different UI frameworks. You know, you can find an example of Todo with Angular, with React, with Swell, any number of pro uh, projects, any number of frameworks. Uh, and this is a good uh, app for us to test. It's basically you adding the Todo, you check mark it, you delete it, you filter items by completed or active, etc. So back to testing. Now I introduce you what we're gonna test throughout today. And now let's actually see what we're gonna do. Um, there are a couple of scenarios I want to introduce here and go through for today's presentation. The first case would be, imagine if you have a backend using Java and for many testing would be Java. You know, in case of Python, some people use Python on the backend, they will also use Python for testing. I would say that there is a problem with this approach where you try to match what to the backend for actual testing for the language that you use for testing. Uh, because ultimately for web, for web apps, you're seeing it from the end user perspective. Even if you're writing end-to-end -end tests, even if you're writing unit tests, it doesn't matter. You don't have to match your backend with a testing code. And so that's why I'm suggesting us to move away from being bound to whatever is in the backend uh, and just go away from it and rather focus on hybrid model, domain-driven development, and user-centric testing. When I'm saying these words, what I, mean, what I mean by hybrid model is that many companies in the past couple of years, they went through transformation where they used to have testers as a separate team from developers. So developers would write some production code, they would throw it at testers, testers will test it, I give the feedback back to developers, and there will be like a fairly massive feedback loop, fairly slow one. And, we want, and people have been trying to, companies have been trying to avoid that, and they called everybody now software engineer and using this hybrid model where developers are the ones who test and testers are the ones who develop. So there is no separation anymore. Uh, it means that you are trying to use the software engineering principles, even with the test infrastructure, but you are emphasizing the test expertise that the testers bring. So it's not just the fact that it's, testers don't do anything and developers just do the important work, work. No, both parts can actually bring something important to the table and we need to find both of best of both worlds. This is what hybrid model is. And by again, going away from a backend testing and just focusing again on the end user, uh, this is why hybrid model is so important. This is domain-driven development principle that plays a role here as well. Domain-driven design, uh, one of the main ideas there is ubiquitous language. You're trying to speak the same language with your developers as you would with your end users. When a user talks about an account and in the back end you call it user.java or uh, something else, there's this misalignment, there is that miscommunication that happens. You want to actually match what your end user would care because nobody cares what kind of great pattern you use at the back end. Ultimately, it all ends up of what your customer gets. So customer is what we care about really here. And we're trying to speak the same language as they. Uh, that's why instead of backend testing, we do front-end testing even in the lowest levels. Because context matters. You don't want to do this context switching of how you test internally, when you talk to the user. And again, it's all about keeping it user-centric. And I've been repeating that over and over again throughout this uh, couple of slides. If you're still not convinced why I'm saying that making sure that you match your backend language with your testing language, modern web testing focus on the web, it brings up the power of JavaScript. And I'll be emphasizing that regardless of what you have in the backend, throughout your application, throughout the pyramid, unit, integration, and end-to-end, -end, you can use JavaScript, because that's what web is, for many of us, is based on. You know, it can be PHP, it can be something else, it can be hack, but really JavaScript, for majority of the web, outside of like WordPress and such, um, and that's what I will be focusing on today. When it comes to power of JavaScript, I'll talk about assertion libraries, process libraries, and inter enterprise libraries. So assertion libraries, things like Jest, Jasmine, process libraries, uh, it's behavioral driven development libraries like Cucumber and enterprise libraries uh, like Apply tools for testing. It helps uh, help us with visual testing. And speaking the language of the web, JavaScript, in particular, I'll talk about Node.js. So when it comes to Node.js, it's isomorphic. It basically helps you to uh, write code for server side and the front end for the UI then it's fairly flexible, obviously, and it's customizable. 
And it all comes down to the uh, power of uh, NPM manager as well. You have packages. So you can basically reuse something that other people built and simply import those uh, packages and use them, whether it's for testing or development code. But going back to the pyramid, web test pyramid, it's very much the same as you know any other pyramid would be. It's uh, with unit tests, low cost, high speed, and still quite a low level of confidence in the overall app. But for the unit testing, for the web unit testing, uh, we'll use Jasmine for an example to showcase how it can be done for your app. So um, let's say for our to-do app, we have this simple function that takes an input, it converts it to JSON, and basically returns you know name and state here name of the to do and the state active in a, a completed etc when it comes to actually writing a test with jasmine we first initialize the test suite a create to do item then we create a test case where we accept valid test data we initialize the to do item here we basically pass some um, data to test uh, some uh, data that we know of brainstorm ideas and the state is incomplete and we do simple validation we make sure the name matches what we, what we expected after the app processes after the function in this case process it that's what the unit test is you think you're testing a single function create to do item and jasmine lets you do that and i didn't care how that function is processed in the back end what kind of services are being invoked with what what kind of language you have at the back end. Ultimately, your end user wouldn't call the service directly. Your user would call this function on the front end, on the JavaScript side. And that's what I'm gonna test here. If I go up the level of the pyramid, an integration test in the web context, I would use Jest, amazing framework. Uh, it's a test framework, they have so many things there. I'll give you uh, one particular thing called snapshot testing with Jest. It's a Facebook open source project, by the way. So imagine you have this React component. And it's kind of an old pattern of writing it, but imagine that we do. We have this create to do function, a create to do component, I would say, that has a random a render um, a function that returns you a button. And it generates a certain action on click and has the label create. And it also has some sort of styling attached to it. I know people usually don't combine comp you know, component and styling, but this is for simplicity reasons, just to show you visually what the component might look like in case you never seen React before, which is totally fine. And let's say if I were to test with Jest, I would create a test suite. I would say create a to-do button is what I'm trying to test here. I render a component, basically I load it, I initialize it, and I call it, you know, by what it is, create to-do and i convert it to json and i save it as we call a snapshot what snapshot is is basically this uh, piece of code it, it renders the component it renders everything in that component as the web would see it you know the function you can see it's an undefined because it's in isolation here name the class names uh, and styles and if there was anything to be changed to this component we would catch this after we validate these snapshots so to reflect on these two levels of the pyramid that we just looked at, every step has only one focus, and it's developers. Even though I kept saying that user-centric testing is important, I keep talking about those lower levels of testing, and uh, their focus is still on developers. Good for some tests, this kind of focus, but not for end-to-end -end tests. For end-to-end -end tests, we still very much care about our users. And when it comes to end-to-end -to -end tests, uh, just to remind, they are the highest cost, lowest speed, but they give you the highest confidence level. And all these kind of three points have to be kept in mind throughout your writing tests. So to shift focus from developers towards your users is what we need to do when we are writing these end-to-end -end tests. So it might sound great to do this shift of the focus, but how do we actually do that? So end-to-end -end task testing is what we, is, uh, what we need to do. User-centric testing. It means that instead of interactions, we do tasks. We focus on tasks in hand. You do not care about, you know, for instance, we have a workflow of the user logging in. You don't want to describe your test as user uh, types in, sends keys in for the username, for the password. A user presses the button uh, to submit this form. You don't want that language to be used when you're writing your tests. Instead, user enters username 
user enters a password, user presses OK button. You do not go deep into like send keys if you talk Selenium. You don't focus on individual interactions, you focus on the task at hand. Instead of if you're talking about particularly writing code, writing test code, instead of page object model, we're using something called screenplay model, screenplay pattern, where really it's how you write, how you speak, how you name your functions, what matters. So, but back to our apps. End to end testing is a common way to do what's the common way to do end to end? Obviously, it's Selenium Web Driver. It's at this point, it's a de facto end to end tool, great tool. Test, it's basically a testing standard at this point, and it's generic, meaning it can be fit for most use cases, I would say. And more importantly, it uh, shows you, um, it has quite a high integration with plenty of other open source projects, plugins, uh, weights, objects, etc. So it has a great community behind it. It's an open source project. So Selenium Web Driver, what it actually looks like behind the scene, doesn't really matter to us as much, but ultimately what we care about, it has different bindings for different programming language. So what you'd like to use, you can use. Uh, but again, I want to go away from matching your backend with your front-end testing. And also it has uh, drivers for you know Internet Explorers, Firefox, and whatever you'd like. So since I've been talking about JavaScript in particular, the front-end testing for the front-end, I'd like to bring up WebDriver.js. And by the way, it is important how, we cap how I capitalize GS, because WebDriver.js with two capital J and S is a different framework altogether. G in the, the large uh, capital G and uh, J and uh, small s is the uh, official uh, WebDriver um, bindings for JavaScript. So Selenium WebDriver.js, it's still de facto end-to-end -end tool, still a testing standard, still generic, and has a great integration with the open source community. And in terms of how it actually looks behind the scene, just the bindings are Node.js, exactly what we want here. And that's what I'll showcase here. So we have a suite initialized, we name uh, create to do, uh, we initialize the web driver, doesn't matter what exactly it does, just believe that it does initialize it. Then you create an actual test case, you're using the valid data to create a to do, you make sure you wait for the page to load, then you send the name of the web drive uh, of the um, to do of the new to do, and you basically uh, what is in this case you make sure it actually appears, and that's about all. You made sure that it appeared on the web. You edit a new to do, and that's all. Nothing special there. That's how you would do it with any other web driver bindings, Java, C sharp, whatever else. Unfortunately, they're not just the good parts to web driver JS. Uh, with any end-to-end -end test complexities, there is always an issue of how you select, how you find your elements on the web, uh, how you locate them, what's the test flow like, and what kind of single-page application, uh, what framework it can uh, work for. What about uh, WebDriver.js, though? WebDriver.js is great. I mean, selector-wise, it has everything standard ID and CSS and XPath bindings for locators. It has by allocators like by dot for test flows it used to have something called promise manager because node.js by default is async you wouldn't want to have uh, your tester or your developers worry about managing this asynchrony and so the promise manager allowed you to write this kind of sequential code before but we've since removed it and now it's await and async by we i mean open source community did and it's still very generic, so it can work with anything. It, but still, it looks limited, though. I mean, the by selectors are great. ID, CSS uh, selectors are nice. But is there anything better? And for special case number two, let's say we have Angular as a front end. Angular is quite popular. And, you know, when it comes to Angular, if you've never seen it before, which is fine, uh, for the way how it's written, you don't have just regular classes. Uh, you have special bind. You have special attributes like ng submit, model change, etc. Uh, basically, it helps you quite heavily to write front end. And in terms of actually testing Angular, we still use the same pyramid for unit testing for integration. But for end-to-end -end testing, we have something special. It's not just WebDriver.js. We don't have to use just WebDriver.js for that. We have 
Protractor. Protractor is an end-to-end -end test framework for Angular apps. It's created and maintained by the Angular uh, JS folks. So Protractor is basically everything the WebDriver.js has, but then it has uh, additional things. It has still servers, uh, Selenium server. It has uh, API for Angular in particular, but also it has connection to the AngularJS app. It knows exactly when the app is loaded and ready to be tested, which is a great addition to any test infrastructure. For the protractor, selector-wise, it has element bindings. It has by repeaters. In terms of the uh, of test flow, it knows, as I said, exactly when the app is ready. You don't have to wait for a particular element to appear in order to test, which is a great help. And it's built uh, intentionally built for Angular. In terms of tests, similar tests create to do, validate uh, data, you load the browser for a particular URL, you find element by model, you send keys, and you make sure it appears. You can see that how much less code I had to write, but I did ultimately the same thing. And I didn't have to wait for the app to load. All of that is handled for me. But Angular is great, but there are so many other UI frameworks. Obviously, there is React, there is Vue, there is Ember, Backbone, uh, Swelt, and many others. I think there are more UI frameworks that I can ever count. But let's say we were to use Protractor with React. You technically can. You can remove this uh, ignore synchronization property, it's called. Basically, it doesn't wait for Angular app to load because it won't ever load with React, right? But still, it's it's kind of silly. You're trying to fit one thing into another that wasn't built for it. Uh, really, you you know, I would say non-Selenium UI test frameworks is the next thing to try other than, uh, you know, general uh, web driver for JavaScript. And in here, I'd like to showcase two things, Test Cafe and Cypress.io. So what have we learned so far, though? Patterns, that patterns matter the most when it comes to testing. The common patterns are, you know, how you're handling weights, how you execute in parallel your tests, rapid test development, how quickly can I get my feedback from the test as a developer, especially in hybrid development teams. And can I record and do, do I have an IDE for my test? automation framework. In terms of test cafe, we it handles weights pretty well. Uh, it does allow you to parallel execute your tests. It has a great feedback loop. It gives you feedback fairly quickly and it has a recorder and ID for you to try. To give you an example, if you were to write code itself for test cafe, you can, you create a fixture, what you're trying to test, you load the page, you can see this stream kind of API uh, style of writing code. You initialize your test, you type a name, you click the button, you submit it, and you're done. I'm not gonna dive into particular code that Test Cafe use, but really the recorder that it has is quite nice. Uh, it allows you to kind of, a, if you have a manual team, uh, manual tester team at your company, you can use them to basically record a bunch of these tests and then convert them to code. To, to code. It's kind of a great first step to teach them how to write automation. And it's also quite a nice way to you know, debug your test if you wanted to. So if anything, the idea for Test Cafe is quite nice. But Cypress.io is actually more, I think, getting more traction online lately. And the same thing, it handles weights very well. I can attest to that. It has a great parallel execution support. It gives you feedback extremely quickly. And it does allow you to record uh, your tests. It has a special plugin for that. So if you were to write test code for Cypress, you know, for let's say a login page, something different from the to-do, you basically create the test case for that. You specify username and password. You can even uh, tweak cookies right here if you wanted to. You can say you can get cookies, validate those. Um, you can do basically anything you want. And Cypress has evolved largely from, you know, when I first look, uh, took this, um, made this uh, snapshot for the code for this presentation. And the Cypress, again, it allows you to record things fairly well. You can see in the browser on the side how it's executed and how you can repeat that too. You can also pause it if you want to debug your tests. And uh, yes, yeah, Cypress community has been growing rapidly, has lots of resources about it. So important thing to remember, is to choose the right tool for the right problem. Don't try to fit a thing into uh, 
uh, use case that doesn't work. There are so many test frameworks that I haven't even touched. WebDriver.io, Nightwatch.js, WD, Nemo, so many. Avoid tool mix-ups, if anything. Do not have different tools, test tools in your um, test infrastructure. It increases the complexities. When you're trying to test a complex thing with a complex test infrastructure, you're making it twice as hard, at least twice as hard. There is no ubiquitous language. There is no domain-driven design anymore. And there is no common language. So how do you choose what to use for your infrastructure? You can look at the open source projects at the GitHub pages, GitHub stars, uh, how many NPM load downloads it has, external integrations, and also give it a try and do the proof of concept first before you transition everything you have to use this framework. But more importantly, choose flexibility and your use case. Build it for your use case. In terms of flexibility, what I mean by that is look at cost of transition. Let's say today you're using Angular and you use Protractor. But what if you know that your team, your company is transitioning to React in a couple of months, in a year, in two? Or maybe you haven't actually thought of that, but it will happen. So maybe investing in Protractor is not the best option. So think of that. Think about return of an, on investment. Does it even worth switching to Cypress if you're fully on Selenium? It might. Count hours, count time you spent on maintaining those Selenium tests and then see if it valid, you know, justifies you spending time learning Cypress, moving to Cypress, etc. Um, can you actually customize the framework you're using for use case, for you, your, your use case, if it changes? And can you replace it easily? In terms of, again, thinking of your particular application, what's your team expertise? If you're all uh, you know, non-JavaScript developers, Maybe again, everything I said in this presentation of testing with JavaScript is nonsense for your team. It doesn't worth the trouble to then write JavaScript tests. But if you are like a full stack, as they would say sometimes, a uh, team, then it might make more sense. Uh, think of what the application uses. Again, that's what it, why it's important. If you're using Angular, if you're using React, it will play a major role of what test infrastructure you have. Because uh, test infrastructure is what matters. Can you actually support? Do you care about parallel execution at all? Does your, you know, um, service do your service can handle that? And I always like to end my talks with call for action. Evaluate it current. Evaluate your current test infrastructure, test architecture. Does it worth changing it? Have the main boundaries. Know exactly where you're working. Are you going all the way to end to end? Test integration tests, or you can simply stay at unit tests and then don't bother of many changes here. Unify your test strategy. Think about it the long run. And again, don't have the shifts between we have end to end tests with one framework, UI, uh, unit tests with another, and integration, we use some you know uh, old fashioned language for that. So think about that as well. Have it as few hoops you have to jump through when you're testing and debugging those tests as possible. Think of on onboarding someone new for your test infrastructure and it gives you kind of a good perspective. But experiment first. You know, don't just uh, convince your team to switch before you do the proof of concept. Give it a try first and then see if it works. So thank you so much. Unfortunately, we can't do Q&A over the internet here, but if you want to contact me, please do on my on my Twitter, my blog, website, LinkedIn, or email, directly email me.